Yeah, I was just uh, curious as to why the uh, police were at a suburban downtown public meeting. We're here to provide security for AVAP. We're okay. doing our job. We have uh, security just in case there's any trouble. Trouble? What sort of trouble would you expect be expecting at a public meeting in downtown suburban Walnut Creek? Well, we actually have them at all the events. Oh, do you? Yeah. Why is that? Is it very controversial, or why do you have all the police here? I think you, I could let Catalina answer that for you. Catalina. Hello. I'm just curious as to why the police are at a downtown suburban meeting, public we just, meeting. We just have um, security for the meeting, that's all. Oh, you do? Is it controversial or something? or? I don't believe so. Actually, I'm uh, just trying to figure out what plan, one plan Bay Area is all about. We had the same thing, regionalization down in LA, and kind of killed our jobs, so I'm curious if it's going to do the same thing here if I have to move out of state or not. That's the honest truth. From city to city, an incredible hysterical panic spread. As the unimaginable becomes real, the impossible becomes true. What is, what is this uh, plan Bay Area all about? <laughs> what is it all about? Yeah, what's it about? So Plan Bay Area is a um, combination of a land use and population forecast for the region that's prepared to inform the Regional Transportation Plan, which um, is an investment program for almost $300 billion that um, will be programmed into transportation dollars for the nine counties in the Bay Area. And it's updated every four years. This one's going to be hopefully adopted this year, 2013. The next one would hopefully then be adopted in 2017. We definitely need to convert uh, our public from using uh, these polluting automobiles and uh, diesel trucks and motorcycles uh, to uh, public transit. I don't want any part of it. You're forgetting something, Miles. What's that? You have no choice. There's always bicycles too, you know, you can bike to school. Yeah, I came from Oakland out to this meeting in Walnut Creek and it was like, I don't know, 20 miles out here, 15 miles, um, with camera equipment. How would I have gotten out here on the bicycle, or the bus for that matter? Well, Ryan, uh, quite simply, you can bike out here uh, from Oakland, right? Um, and you can put your camera on uh, BART. I don't know that I'd want to do that. You never know who's getting on or off BART, do you? Especially in Oakland. They built, their, they built the BART station in Dublin um, uh, knowing that they're not going to be enough parking spaces so people have to ride their bikes to BART. I mean, that's, you hear them planning this way on purpose. Ride your bike to BART. Ride your bike from your home. Why do you think they're going nuts in Danville? People don't ride their bikes or take the transit. They actually drive. Well, all the, all the BART stations are in not so safe places. I remember when they built it. That's why we have BART police to... Uh, well, I think my camera might be gone before, you know, I was able to call a cop. Well, you want to pack it up. Well, I mean, I, I just know, I know all the, the, uh, the BART tracks happen to be in not so good parts of town. Well... I think there's just maybe one or two stations that are okay, maybe Rockridge. Yeah, Rockridge, Rockridge is safe. And, and downtown, but you got those, uh, fruit, those pesky little occupiers down there from time to time, right? Yeah. Trail is, is kind of risky, right? Yeah, and so in a priority development area, I'd imagine that that means that it's a, a very limited real estate, so you couldn't build a suburban house with a family or a family could live, could you? Well, they really vary a lot from, from place to place. So there are definitely priority development areas in, for example, Contra Costa County, where they probably would have a more suburban type development. Um, this particular plan has uh, priority development areas. And basically, that means that unless you own property in these very narrow areas of a few towns in the San Francisco Bay Area, you literally, for 28 years, will not be able to develop anything outside of those areas. How, how would a uh, mother get her three, three children to different places if she lived in a transit building? What about the soccer practice here, band recital there, that sort of thing? Take the bus? Well, yeah, the, actually, the, the county connection has a 600 series of school buses. Let's say somebody lives in Walnut Creek and they work in San Jose. Um, they'll probably continue to live in Walnut Creek and work in San Jose. Well, I would suggest they downsize from the suburbs of Walnut Creek to the Bart Proximate area, and we're just about to develop 
uh, the Walnut Creek Cranden Village, where we'll have uh, uh, close to 1,400 apartments and condos, and uh, quite simply, uh, the way to get to San Jose. You know the way to San Jose, right? Sure, Dion. And what is a priority conservation area? What does that mean? How do you define that? Um, it's a uh, open space or agricultural area that there's a um, level of community con consensus that the area should be um, should not be zoned for future housing growth. Okay, and the community census, does that mean people vote on it? Um, and there are also priority conservation areas, and that means that you have lost your property rights in all of these rural areas. 100% of development has to happen in the urbanized areas. So you can see this is a very serious constitutional invasion of our privacy, and we need to stop it. Senate Bill 375 that asks us to make one of the targets for the forecast to um, show that the per capita greenhouse um, greenhouse gas emissions will reduce by 15 percent. This was written in 1996, which is the same year that Michelle Peral from the Sierra Club and uh, Richard Clark from PG&E uh, presented to the ABAG General Assembly the idea of a sustainable Bay Area. And then in 1997, ABAG and MTC, along with a couple dozen NGOs and stakeholder groups like Urban Habitat, uh, Greenbelt Alliance, Sierra Club, Ella Baker Foundation, um, Silicon Valley Al uh, uh, Foundation, and the Bay Area Council, among them a bunch of others, signed a compact. And for the past almost 20 years, they've been working on this plan. So this is the blueprint. This is from the early 1990s. So when they say, you know, we're just following a mandate uh, with SB 375, that's just not true. That's just not true. Today we have record high temperatures, quite simply because uh, of global warming, because of the greenhouse gases. I uh, have uh, donated my automobile. I no longer own an automobile. Well, some of those projections were actually wrong. The, the hockey uh, stick uh, projection about global warming was uh, pro proven fraudulent. Well, uh, you sound like a Republican. <laughs> uh, well, actually, we're a coalition of people who are from all ends of the political spectrum, Democrats, Republicans, independents, and decline to states, everything, uh, Tea Party, um, we've got, uh, I believe, the Eagle Forum is part of our coalition. I, of course, am a liberal Democrat, and uh, this is not a partisan issue. This is, freedom is not partisan. Uh, I think you can agree that all Americans deserve their, pri their private property rights, and it's not about uh, left, right, or center. It's about being an American, a free person. Thank you for coming to tonight's public hearing. I know your time is valuable and your attendance tonight is an indication of how much you care about the future of our cities, towns, and our region. It is local elected officials from throughout Contra Costa who are at the table making the decisions, not officials from Sacramento, and not even the folks at ABAG or MTC. Your local land use decisions are going to stay local with your city council. Contra Costa. Excuse me. I will honor you when you are speaking. I would appreciate it if we would all honor each other when someone else is speaking. Thank you. Our county's homegrown Shaping Our Future, which we completed nearly 10 years ago, has been the model for growth in our country, not anything imposed from outside. And in fact, that process served somewhat as the model for this regional effort. Our hearing tonight is your opportunity to comment respectfully for the official record about Draft Plan Bay Area, which is now out for public review. Plan Bay Area offers a long-range transportation and land use vision for the very diverse, unique, and wonderful region that we call home. As you know, the dialogue has been heated at times, but I think it's been an important conversation to have. We have been listening. By looking ahead over the long term, we can provide a foundation for us to build a future that we're proud to pass along to the next generation. My name is Amy Worth, and I serve both on the Orinda City Council as mayor 
and I represent the Contra Costa Cities on the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. We are here to listen tonight to your comments about the draft Bay Area plan. This is our third public meeting in Contra Costa to hear from county residents on Plan Bay Area. While the plan is slated for adoption this summer, it's important to note that it is a work in progress that will be updated every four years to reflect new priorities, new resources, and new approaches. Our goal is to preserve what we love about our region and tackle some of the ongoing problems like maintenance of our roads and the transit system. It's also about adding some choices for people now and in the future, both in terms of housing and transportation. We can give people more choices while retaining the character of existing neighborhoods and preserving the open space that Contra Costa residents value so much. All the comments we hear tonight will be shared with the members, the decision makers who serve on either the Metropolitan Transportation Commission or the Association of Bay Area Governments. Results from all the public hearings as well as comments from an online form and from a telephone survey will be summarized and shared with the boards of MTC and ABAG at our meeting in June. We expect to adopt a final version of Plan Bay Area in July. You can, you can view the draft plan and comment online at our website, onebayarea.org. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Yvonne Wilson. I have lived at the same residence in Lafayette for 43 years. I am requesting that ABAG and MTC extend the public review time for both the draft plan and its draft EIR. As we know, the plan is 160 pages. The draft EIR is over 1,300, with many supplementary technical reports. Staff and consultants have been working on the plan for many years. Most recently, your bodies extended release of both documents by three months for fine tuning, allowing an equivalent amount of time for what could be the most important public review is right and fair, providing parity between the public and those interests cited in the plan as stakeholders. In a representative democracy such as ours, the primary stakeholders are the folks who elect the local, state, and federal representatives, the folks who pay the bills, the public. We elect representatives to govern in our place so that we might do the other tasks necessary to producing a viable country. As follow-up, we are charged and required to review and approve our elected representatives' job performance and work products. Properly, a plan of this magnitude should be submitted to the public for a vote. Short of that, Short of that, an extended public review time of these documents is essential. It is self-evident. ABAG and MTC should provide for no less. Thank, Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you. Next. We have, excuse um, me, I'd like, I understand that you are passionate about this, but I'd like to ask you to hold your applause because you're stealing someone's time and we've got a lot of people here. We have a lot of people here tonight who want to speak, so give them all the opportunity. The next speaker is Richard Aver from Concord, followed by Richard Coleman. Hi, uh, my name is Richard Eber. I'm representing uh, the blog Halfway to Concord, for which I write a column every week, of which I've written six articles recently concerning concerning what's going on today in urban planning in the, the area. Um, 
I just have a couple of comments because there's a lot of people that want to talk. Uh, one of my biggest concerns, having read the report, it's almost like trying to figure out the Obama, Obama uh, medicine plan because it's very complicated. And I agree that the review process needs to be far longer than 45 days for spending all these billions of dollars uh, for the plans over the next 30 years. Um, one of my concerns is that in reviewing the revenues that are being derived uh, for the Bay Area for this plan, uh, Contra Costa seems to be getting the short end of the stick. Um, of the discretionary funds, which amount to $57 billion, this is in the report, Contra Costa is not receiving very much bang for their buck, while San Francisco and San Jose are getting 90% approximately of the funds. Um, the other, my other comment is the whole premise of this report is uh, complying with Senate Bill 335, which relates to reducing greenhouse gases, carbon footprints, global warming, all of the above. And one of the questions that I'm asking is uh, ABAG and MTC thinks that it's very critical and it's the, it's their role uh, in terms of the law of the state of California to comply with uh, the, what the legislature put out. Um, my question is, uh, why, why is this so important while other laws in the state of California are being enforced so selectively, such as immigration uh, and uh, ability to receive welfare and social services. Yes. Go ahead, Richard. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Richard Coleman. I'm a resident of Arinda. I'm here representing myself. I'd like to read you a one-sentence quotation. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat their substance. Who wrote that? It was Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. Jefferson was referring to the King of England. No one on the board of the Metropolitan Transportation Council or Commission or the Association of Bay Area Governments has been directly elected by the people. This is the kind of nonsense that has to stop. California has the highest statutory state sales tax in the United States. California has the highest state income tax bracket in the United States, 13.3%. California has the seventh highest corporate income tax in the nation. My question to you is, where are the jobs? We are being overtaxed and overwhelmed by spendthrift government. ABAG and MTC are job killers. The time has come to abolish MTC and ABAG, and that time is now. Thank you. Okay, I'm a, an Arinda resident, and my comments are of a general nature about local control, and I have expressed many of these at various visioning sessions. I realize that Sacramento has given you a mandate, but it appears this has evolved into empire building. Our tax dollars are intended for our benefit, and I consider the salaries, benefits, and pensions for MTC ABAG and CCTA obscene. MTC actions to purchase a building in San Francisco, the proposal of a bridge party, and the planned Bay Area proposal are improper use of our taxes. I would like to abolish ABAG, and I would like MTC to downsize. MTC should stick to transportation and get out of the real estate business. The way we could spend, that way we could expend 
to spend our existing taxes on roads. I am offended that you would fine us if, you, if we want to use local control or blackmail us in order to get us to accept your plan. Either way, it's the same. We should keep in mind that our nation has a long history of appro uh, opposing dictators or anyone who has taken away our property rights and local control. And I do disagree with you in saying, oh, we have local control. We don't have local control if you're going to fine us or if you're going to blackmail us. And keep our taxes. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Vince Majorana. The better half just spoke. <laughs> what I'm going to talk about is 375 because this is the controlling document for all of what we're here to talk about tonight. There are 10 targets on 375. Two of them are very important because they are mentioned number one and number two. Well, number one is greenhouse gases, GHG. And what they want to do is get in out of our cars and into other kinds of transportation. It's very interesting that 375, the Senate, I don't know, they didn't walk to their building, their staff didn't walk to their building, they didn't take a bus, they have private parking, and they want us to get out of our cars, get on the bar, get onto the bus, get on the bicycle. Leadership leads by example, and they're not going to be doing the same thing. The, if we have this, they want us to build houses in the PDAs and we need local control over those PDAs and those houses. One of the things that is said in these documents, this is, I, I only talk about the document that we have. I've always said we're trapped. And one of the end sentences is I read very slowly and clearly states direct discretionary transportation funding to communities building housing PDAs. Repeat that to you. What this means is discretionary funding. That means a bag. MTC, they are a hand of SP 375. They can have discretionary transportation funding to communities building houses in the PDAs. Thank you, Vince. If they don't do that, Thank you, you Vince. may not get the funding. Don't, don't be fooled. Thank you. I submitted a question uh, trying to be positive about the plan and the EIR, and the question was phrased like this. I did a word search on the plan, uh, the digital copy of the plan, and I word searched for BART parking. There was none. Uh, this kind of gave me the impression that the plan is slightly slanted to someone's vision on how all the MTC abiotic funds should be spent for the next 30, 40 years. Now, I live in Arenda. I live in a 3,000 foot home on a half acre zone house. I'm very happy. And when I read in the plan that the reasons you want dense, multi, multi density type of housing is because the rising populations of Asians and Latinos seem to favor this modality. Well, I can assure you that if you gave them the choice of that versus what I have, the answer is simple. The, the reason that you're going to the dense multi-family uh, 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 20 uh, units per acre type of planning that's defined in SB 375 is strictly an economic thing and quite frankly it's driven by development efforts and development uh, people who were in uh, the uh, Speaker of the House's office when 375 was drafted. So that's the special interest stakeholder there. Now, I think you need to broaden the plan, 
You need to put quality of life in what it is you're doing. This stack and pack is only serving one interest and it's not serving your clients and it's not serving us who live in the communities so where we have to accommodate these things. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Next is Kate Jenkins, followed by Brian Masters, followed by Evie Stivers, followed by Ralph Hoffman, and then Ed Gorzinski. Hi, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Kathleen Jenkins. I live in Arenda, and I've been a proud member of Arenda as a resident for 17 years. I'm one of these people that are firm believers in free market economy. What does this plan re presume? There is a, a market for stack and pack housing in Arinda. If there was an interest, wouldn't these already be built? Because they're not already there, this means that there's no market demand for this type of housing. If there is no demand, this means people don't want the type of housing you are suggesting and that means that these will need to be heavily subsidized with public funding. If you put the stack and pack housing close to our rent of public transportation, this suggests that you'll need to replace existing land use, which leads us to the need for eminent domain. Why would any city allow others to take the power to decide land use away from individual cities and citizens who support the local community and schools? and put it in the hands of others who don't live there and don't support the community. Furthermore, your plan and draft EIR concedes that past decisions by residents and current preference in survey responses indicate that 60 to 80 percent of all new homes are requested to be stack and pack. Where is the empirical evidence that people's preferences will dramatically shift toward wanting to live in stack and pack housing. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kathleen. And most in, final in the vision of the Plan Bay Area, both the quality of communities they live in and their capacity to earn a decent living at, at stake. At our annual Campaign for Jobs conference, over 250 of our members adopted a set of principles which called which is called Livable Communities Initiative, which is the first building trade union in the nation to do so. Much of the Plan Bay Area supports this initiative. For example, protecting our open space as it does push construction towards infill development, providing us work with reducing greenhouse gas emission, emissions, excuse me. Having housing placing along transit corridors and having lots of choices for transit will help our members, families get to their needs to go and make transit less costly. We are concerned that not enough is being done to provide housing is affordable to our members. A union sheet metal worker building thousands of houses, units, envisions, plans, makes less than 40000 a year. Not enough to pay for a $2,800 or more apartment rent. We are concerned that the plan Bay Area is completely silent on thousands of construction jobs that will result from building of this plan. Here's why we are concerned. The current business models for developers building infill development is based on creating a low-wage workforce imported for Central Valley. For example, a developer by the name of Bree has two projects in Sunnyvale totaling over 600 units. At this site, 17 of the 34 contractors were based outside the region. Sheet metal workers were paid $12 an hour and brought in from Sacramento. Why, there is, why is there nothing the plan's encouraging to use local workforce and paying these workers area standards wages? Why is there nothing in the plan of the benefit of having several billion of construction dollars circulated in the local economy? Thank you. Units of affordable housing had a wait list of over 2,500 people that showed up in one day needing affordable housing. Uh, over 60% of the people that applied lived in San Mateo were current residents in need of housing. This is critically needed. Contra Costa has taken a lead on affordable housing production in the past. This community, Walnut Creek, has been one of the best communities to live in and to build in for a long time. And so we really appreciate the leadership that elected officials from Contra Costa have done in, in leading this plan. You know, much of Measure J really shaped the transportation plan, and I really appreciate the hard work that you've done. I am concerned, though, with the volunteer nature of the the land use component. 
uh, specifically that Eastern Contra Costa is taking on so much more development than all of Marin and Napa com combined. Uh, I think that speaks to the volunteer nature of uh, Eastern Contra Costa communities willing to take on more growth, which is great, but we really need, with 60,000 people in commuting into Marin every day, and so many low-income jobs with people being forced to, to commute from Richmond and Solano County, it's, uh, there is an opportunity to improve the plan. So thank you very much for all of your hard work. Thanks, Evelyn. Okay, the next speaker is Ralph Hoffman, followed by Ed Virginsky, followed by Jack Paulus, followed by H. Pruitt. Uh, elected uh, Chair Pierce, I believe you were an elected member of the Clayton uh, City Council. Uh, elected uh, Chair Worth, I believe you were an elected member of the uh, Arenda City Council. And elected Supervisor Mitchell, I'm Ralph Hoffman. And uh, I live at the luxurious uh, Mercer condominiums here in downtown Walnut Creek, just two blocks from Bart. And I own a condominium there. I took the free trolley and walked the rest of the way for good exercise. I am a member of the Advisory Council on Aging and the Senior Mobility Action Council. But what I would like to ask today is uh, when will the additional half cent sales tax uh, be put on the ballots? This is similar to Measure J, both in Contra Costa and Alameda County where it nearly passed so that we can improve uh, the roads and uh, public transit in our county. And uh, finally, I might say we definitely need to reduce uh, the influence of uh, gas. And gas, by the way, can be spelled G-A-S-S -S with a first name of Heather. Uh, that's an alternate way of looking at things. Thank you. followed by Jack Paulus, followed by H. Pruitt, followed by Patty Strong. Okay, my name is Ed Gorzinski and I'm a resident of Orenda. I've lived in the Bay Area for over 48 years and, it's, and I seem to remember that when ABAG was started, it was an association of cities that wanted to cooperate to try to solve some mutual problems. However, I now see that ABAG and MTE a and the state are now dictating how many people are to live in each city and how they are to be housed. This is supposed to be an equitable solution to the growth of jobs and population. However, from where I have seen, these projections are fallacious and cannot be proved. How did we come this far without your fumbling? I was wondering I was wondering where you people get the idea that you could run people's lives. One bay area will not prepare the bay will not preserve the bay area's quality. It will be disastrous for the quality of life of all hard-working successful people and their families. Your homogeneity homogeneity of homogeneous of communities will make all citizens poorer. It's like wine, the winemaker, mixing different vintages. All the wine will be mediocre at best. The only ones that will benefit are the bureaucrats and the very rich developers. The middle class will no longer exist. When I joined the Marine Corps, I took an oath to defend the Constitution from foreign and domestic enemies. I guess it's time to fight people and organizations that are trying to bring down our country and life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness from within. I say to all the city council members to reject one Bay Area and to get back to being reasonable, responsible, I mean, for your cities and towns and to your residents who elected to live there and to elect you. Good evening. I, I'd like to speak on one of the two primary mandates that's driving this entire thing, and that's the greenhouse gas mandate. The trend of people driving electric-only vehicles is, is accelerating. 
I'm especially aware of this because over the last six years I've commuted with an electric only vehicle that is now powered by the solar panels on my roof, which means that both my home electric use and my commute are emissions free. Lessening emissions is one of the mandated targets of this plan, yet my ability to do this is only possible because I have a roof on which I can have solar panels. If the high density housing route is pursued, then future options for many people for decades into the future will be limited and that they will not be able to do what I am doing today. My concern is that if we create plans considering only last century's transportation technologies, we will end up preventing such efficiencies in the future and we will actually be creating more emissions than we would have otherwise as even the best laid plans can have large unintended consequences like these. And in terms of equity, even today there are many lease options available with no upfront money required making solar panels available to persons of all income levels, but not if they live in high density housing with no place to put them. The trend of zero emissions residential solar power is also accelerating, which decentralizes power generation making the entire system more robust as well. And yet the present plans for high density housing will prevent others from living emissions free because they will have nowhere to put the panels. So my question is, given that this plan is largely driven by reducing emissions, why would you choose, especially in spite of the accelerating trends both in electric vehicle use and solar power adoption, to make the combination of emissions-free commuting and emissions-free power generation impossible for so many future homeowners? It seems to me that we may be trying to deal with 21st century issues with 20th century solutions. Yes. Yes. All right. My name is Heather Pruitt, and I live in Orinda. Been a resident there for about 13 years, and I have two points to make. They'll both be fairly concise. The first has already been made, but I want to make it again because it's very important. A very short time ago, in late March, ABAG released the Bay Area Plan, Plan Bay Area, its development plans. One comment people need to be aware of, it's 160 pages long, and along with it comes the 1,300 page environmental impact report. ABAG putting a deadline for concerned citizens to read all of that and respond by May 16th is completely impossible. It's unreasonable, and I am requesting that the deadline be extended by an additional 90 days. That's the first point. The second point I want to make is that ABAG really could not be forcing an increase in housing supply and pushing the unwanted stack housing, especially in small communities like Orinda, at a worse time. It doesn't make any sense to me when we've had over three and a half million people leave this state and go to other states due to high taxes, due to high unemployment, which has not gotten any better. And meanwhile, I work full time at a very large utility company, and I'm starting to see a lot of people, my approximate age group, starting to retire. And where I'm going with this is we all know the baby boomers are starting to retire. A lot of people are starting to, to retire. Um, in particular, there's about 78 million born between 1946 and 1961 who are going to be retiring in this area. They're going to be leaving. A lot of them are, as we've seen the trend. We told you this is the worst possible time to be adding in mass development stack housing when people are leaving and that trend is clearly going to continue. Yes. followed by Heather Goss, followed by Susan Edward. Uh, yes, I'm an Orinda resident, and I want to talk about Orinda because that's what I know best. I am opposed to changing the semi-rural nature of Orinda. Therefore, I oppose Plan Bay Area. This plan would change my way of life irreversibly for the worst. Most of the Orinda residents live in single-family homes. We drive our cars to work, to schools, to shopping. Most of us do not ride bicycles or walk to downtown Orinda. Plan Bay Area wants us to give up our cars and use bicycles or walk. This plan will also reduce the number of cars that can park in the downtown area. 
Orinda has limited space to build low income, high density, stack and pack housing. We citizens do not have a clear idea of where we would build this housing. And according to the Orinda City Council minutes, we might be required by the housing element of the Bay, Bay, excuse me, the Bay Pan, Plan Bay area to look for housing blight and search out the residential areas and businesses near transit to meet this requirement. I interpret this to mean that eminent domain would be used to force our families and businesses near transit. The citizens of Orinda voted to incorporate the city of Orinda so that we can make our own decisions. We did not vote for the Plan Bay area. I believe this plan cannot and will not work. Thank you. I oppose Plan Bay area, including but not limited to all low income, high density, stack and pack housing projects. Organizations such as ArindaWatch.org and Pleasant Hill Citizens for Responsible Growth have identified a plethora of community population growth, overcrowding, crime, police, educational, land use, vehicle use, tax, funding, and environmental issues which are not adequately addressed by Plan Bay Area. So I have several questions related to this, and one of them was identified by Evelyn, the first speaker, and that is, why is Plan Bay Area, a plan of such great magnitude, not being presented to the citizens of the Bay Area, including Contra Costa County, for their vote? Governor Brown put on all those tax increases in the last election on the ballot. Why can't this, if it's such a great plan, be put on the ballot for the citizens to decide? I realize it's not required by law, but if, this, if all of you believe in this plan, as you uh, specify, why can't you put it on the ballot for us? Plan Bay Area <coughs> requires 80% of all new houses to be stack and pack. Where is the empirical peer-reviewed evidence that 80% of Bay Area citizens want to live in high-density stack and pack housing? SB 375 requires unfunded mandates on counties and cities to be identified. Where is the analysis in the plan and the draft EIR of the cost to counties and cities of these unfunded mandates and the impact of this cost? Why is there zero funding in Plan Bay Area for more schools, police, and fire protection needed for the population growth identified in the plan? Where in Plan Bay Area is the analysis of the impact of low income, high density, stack and pack housing on the property values of surrounding properties and the crime rates of applicable Bay Area communities? Since the plan impacts all nine Bay Area counties and all 101 cities of the Bay Area, why doesn't Plan Bay Area include city by city as well as county by county economic and environmental impact analysis? Thank you. I have been coming to these rigged meetings, fake input sessions for years now, and we've been told all kinds of lies about how this plan is a homegrown plan, the local cities want it, we've been told that this is, that we're just following a mandate and if we don't like it, go talk to our state legislators. Um, and that's a bunch of lies. This plan has been in the works for almost 20 years. This is the blueprint for a sustainable Bay Area. It was written in 1996 by David Early of Urban Ecology and in it, it has a special thanks to ABAG, the Association of Bay Area Governments, for printing. I've done the research. The Association of Bay Area Governments signed a compact in 1997 with a handful of NGOs and stakeholder groups like Urban Habitat, Greenbelt Alliance, Sierra Club, the Bay Area Council. No, I can't. I only have two minutes. You're going to have to keep up. So, Basically, this plan has been in place, and you guys have been planning this, and this is not about a state-mandated legislation. And Mark Destanier was on the ABAG board, and he is a co-author of SB 375. So that is a lie. The people of the Bay Area deserve to know the truth that this has been worked on behind the scenes without a vote and approval of the people of the Bay Area. And this is going to socially re-engineer all of our lives over the next 40 years. And you guys know this. And you are 
you are exposed now for the truth. Stop lying to the public. This is not about saving the planet. This is about socially re-engineering our lives. You have no right to do this. You are an unelected body. I don't care if you're elected officials. You were not elected to do this. Uh, there is no such thing as regional government. And I've come up here over and over and over again, and I'm sick of being lied to. I, all the input that we've given, we've never gotten our questions answered. How much is it gonna cost? What is this gonna do to our schools? Fire, safety. None of these, it have, we, none of us have been given answers about this. Thank you, we Heather. We have to run around, and then you bring in police officers because the you're afraid of The next speaker is Susan oh. Edward. Tell the truth. This is not a mandate. Uh, my name is Roger Acuna. I'm with the Concord Independent Living Resources in, uh, for Contra Costa in Solano County. We're an ABC that provides uh, advocacy support services for people with disabilities. And one common theme that we've um, run across uh, over time is that our clients are uh, looking for accessible housing. As you know, we're currently um, into the baby boomer phase. Uh, we are also fighting a war we can't win uh, with our war vets that are coming from overseas. Uh, guys are coming home in body bags. We're coming home without legs. We're coming home without arms, uh, without sight. And I get these calls all the time, and we need to have a community that's accessible. And what I'm talking about is a concept. What I want to request is an addendum to the ABAG, um, ABAG document that we include the accessible um, universal access design for housing. I'm not talking about the Fair Housing Act laws. I'm not talking about California hack. California Act compliance. Um, Universal Design just talks about for new housing developments to include accessible design features so that folks are able to live in place um, so they don't have to move into a, a nursing home when they get older. Um, so folks are able to visit other houses, um, other places um, freely without having to worry about turnaround space, without having to worry about, uh, so they are able to navigate freely. And what I have here is, is a, a brochure on seven principles on universal housing design. Um, and I'm gonna leave these here for the panel and for you to read freely. Uh, Thank you, Roger. So I'll, I'll have this hand this out for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. And I look forward to having an ongoing discussion over the um, four, eight, ten, twenty-five years, as long as I'm here. Thanks. Thank you, Roger. The next speaker is Fern Matheson, followed by Reed Robertson, followed by Nina Armstrong, followed by Adam Garcia. My name is Fern Matheson, Lafayette resident for 34 years currently the Vice President of the Happy Valley Improvement Association and the Happy Valley Improvement Association rep to the Lafayette Homeowners Council. The Happy Valley Improvement Association has been in existence for over 65 years, representing the 1,100 households north of the Lafayette BART station. We meet nine times during a calendar year with an additional annual meeting to discuss issues of the day. We also send out a newsletter, newsletter in advance of the annual meeting. One year we had the fire chief come and go over with, with what we could do to make our area of the city safer. We are a neighborhood of older, narrow, winding roads in a hilly environment with few ingress and egress points. 
what you would call a fire trap. Actually, all of Lafayette neighborhoods are within valleys. Akalani's Valley, Burton Valley, Relief Valley, and Happy Valley, all of which have the same constraints. Plan Bay Area will change our way of life irreversibly. We vote for relatively minor changes in our life, like a quarter percent sales tax increase. Whether or not a vote is statutorily mandated, why on earth is this plan on such a, of such a magnitude not being presented to the citizens of the Bay Area for a vote? The City of Lafayette has a general plan. I served on the Citizens Advisory Commission. I also attended every Shaping Our Future meeting, and Shaping Our Future didn't fly. Do you remember that? We also have a downtown specific plan, plus five years in the making, was five years in the making. I attended 80% of the meetings. Uh, okay, well, I've got Thanks. more to say, but Thanks. I'll Thanks, send Mark. it to you in writing. Don't worry about it. Thank Thanks. you. <laughs> followed by Nina Armstrong, followed by Adam Garcia, followed by Erica Hahn. Hi, I'm Reed Robertson from Marinda. Um, recently, in the last 10 years or so, ANIAC has brought several thousand um, affordable income sponsored tenants into their city. Over the last, say, five years, combined with the housing collapse, houses that were selling for $700,000 are now selling for less than two. Um, with the recent complete collapse in land values and tax revenues to the city. Um, they cannot improve their schools, their infrastructure. All they do now is try to hire more police to stop the rising amount of violent crimes. I personally have seen somebody been shot in the street, a 15-year-old girl. I've seen somebody get run over. I've been assaulted. Um, I think you need to consider, I only go to Antioch at, at 9 a.m. before everybody wakes up in the morning. I work there. <laughs> I'm concerned for my own personal safety. You know, Amy, you and I both live in Arinda. Um, if you were, if, I'm not exactly sure. I, I consider myself to be a relatively smart guy. I didn't, I don't, I read all those things. I, I don't know what any of it meant. Um, I asked questions. I, I still don't know what it meant. <laughs> I mean, if something like that was to happen in Arunda, I don't know any of your constituents that would, would stand for it. Uh, your own house would collapse in value along with everyone else's. You also have a situation in Antioch now where the people that can get out are getting out because, I mean, they just simply don't want to have a, I mean, just an undesirable neighbor next door. I mean, again, it's, it's not, they've destroyed the whole city. So. Hi, my name is Nina Armstrong and I'm a resident of Arinda. Your plan calls for high density housing next to the freeway. You must not be aware of the following key studies on air pollution and health effects near high traffic areas. This list was put together by the Environmental Law and Policy Center and the Sierra Club. Air pollution from busy roads linked to shorter lifespans for nearby residents. Truck traffic linked to childhood asthma hospitalizations. Pregnant women who live near high traffic areas more likely to have premature and low birth weight babies. Traffic related air pollution associated with respiratory symptoms in two year old children. People who live near freeways exposed to 25 times more particle pollution. Asthma more common for children living near freeways. Children living near busy roads more likely to develop cancer. Most traffic related deaths due to air pollution, not traffic accidents. Emissions from motor vehicles dominate cancer risk. Cancer risk higher near major sources of air pollution, including highways. A school's proximity to freeways associated with asthma prevalence, lung function reduction among children more likely if living near large traffic. Proximity of a child's residence to major roads linked to hospital admissions for asthma. 
Your pretty propaganda shows young and old frolicking in your complexes next to the freeway. But your solution in your plan calls for those citizens to lock themselves inside with their air conditioning on. Your plan is unhealthy for citizens and for communities. You are um, favoring the developers over the most vulnerable. I stand with the most vulnerable. I stand against Plan Bay Area. Thank you. Next is Adam Garcia, followed by Erica Hahn, followed by Amy Fleming, followed by Rusty Snow. Uh, good evening, ladies. Uh, my name is Adam Garcia. Uh, I am a resident of San Francisco, but I was born and raised in the Panhandle Annex of Richmond. Uh, I'd like to point out also that I think that somewhat uh, uh, the population of this room a, a bit is underrepresentative of the Contra Costa County as a whole, and I think that a lot of the areas that can benefit the most from these redevelopment efforts are often the low-income communities, and so I'd like to just point that out for the record. Uh, in growing up in the Panhandle Annex of Richmond in the small income, uh, small low income community had a major in, uh, imprint on me. Sandwiched between two freeways, I can still remember the strong sense of community I felt between my neighbors. Some of my favorite memories are backyard barbecues, riding bikes in the street, playing with other kids, climbing a great pine tree in the front yard, and helping our neighbors when they were down on their luck. When we were, all, we were all from different backgrounds, with parents that worked in other cities and counties, but we all saw that little street as our home. So now as Plan Bay Area moves along, I'm excited to see how the plan can help foster a stronger sense of community throughout our region, just as I felt on that little street in Richmond. Will the plan create more parks, community spaces, better connected bike lanes, and homes for all types of families? I certainly hope so, and I believe that with the right mechanisms that it can achieve this goal. It's an incredible challenge that cannot be ignored, but cannot also be solved by the same lines of thought that got us into this situation. I support Plan Bay Area for its efforts to begin thinking of ourselves as a connected region, recognizing that no single person, family, neighborhood, city, or even county can exist on its own. I look forward to a Bay Area that is strengthened by connections between people, jobs, home schools, and the places that make this region an awesome place to live and love. Thank you. Fleming, followed by Rusty Snow, followed by Robert Bing. Hi there, my name is Erica and I grew up in Moraga. Um, I went away to college but am back in this area now and I am here supporting Plain Bay Area and related to what Adam just mentioned, I think it is very important to think about um, the connections between places rather than just individual jurisdictions. Um, one example that I can give of that, um, I ride my bike a lot for transportation, for recreation, um, because I love it. And I have family that lives in Danville, which uh, they live very close to the Iron Horse Trail. And so I thought, oh great, I can ride on the bike trail from Moraga to Lafayette, and then from Walnut Creek all the way to Danville, which was really wonderful, except for the one section um, connecting those trails when there was just, I was in the middle of Walnut Creek and there's cars zooming around and it's very, very unsafe. And so I think, I think it's critical to um, think of this sort of holistically and think of those border areas rather than just individual and Tom Collins. Um, good evening. Thanks for having us. Um, my name is Amy, I'm 24 years old. And I think that's important because this plan is going to address some pretty important years of my life between being 24 and being in my 50s. Um, and when I think about that, I, am, I grew up on the East Coast and I moved here for a reason because I love the Bay Area. Everyone in this room loves the Bay Area and there's a lot of passion for this place. And I wanted to be somewhere where people were passionate about where they lived. Um, part of why I love it too is because I don't need to own a car. Um, which I can't afford because <laughs> I'm 24. And I love that I can live here, I can be outside with friends, I can go to my community without a car, and I can also go up into the beautiful parks of the East Bay and I can recreate here, and I can truly find some sort of community that is really meaningful to me and why I moved here. Um, and so when I think about this plan, and I know it's driven by transportation, 
I think it's important to consider how important my generation is going to be in the shaping of this whole region. And for me, a lot of that's going to be how do we find alternatives to cars? Not saying that anyone shouldn't have one, but if I can't afford to have one or choose not to have one, I'd like to still be a part of this community. Um, so thank you. Robert Bain, Tom Collins, and Chris Engel. Hello, uh, I am Rusty Snow. I'm a member of the nonpartisan group called Arinda Watch. Last month, Arinda Watch had a, had a very large town hall meeting with over 325 people. From that meeting, our surveys indicated that the majority of citizens oppose losing local control of their small towns. It appears the majority of citizens oppose the Plan Bay Area and its concepts of regionalism. Should policies like the Plan B area be decided by the citizens and through a democratic process? Or should the fate of the citizens be decided by an outside agency? Would the administrators of the Plan B area do the right thing and allow the Plan B area to be decided by popular vote? Number two, uh, uh, I agree with the other people that the uh, plan and the EIR uh, should be extended to allow people to uh, have time to review it and to make comments. Our concern with the Plan B area is that we do not believe in many cases that it is based upon logical assumptions or accurate facts. Concerning this, I have the following questions. What right does ABEG have to mandate that the stack and pack housing be built if this ruins the character of our small towns? The plan calls for housing near mass transit. Why would anyone want to live next to BART? Have you ever tried to take a nap next to a BART train? I, I, that's kind of a, a loose comment. I mean, a, maybe a little simplistic, but uh, I think that's a quality of life, is being able to take a nap during the day, et cetera. And, and BART is extremely noisy and not good for you know, uh, living next to it. Wouldn't it make more sense for businesses to be located close to the mass, to a mass transit like BART and housing located away from BART, the Plan B area poses the exact opposite of this. Would stack and pack housing, would stack and pack housing have an impact on adjacent property values? Has this been carefully analyzed? If the adjoining properties are negatively affected, how are the property owners going to be compensated? Are there not laws that address the responsibility on governments if their actions cause property values to drop. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have Robert Bain followed by Tom Collins, followed by Chris Engel, followed by Peter Singleton. Good evening. My name is Robert Ring. I also live in Orinda. Rusty just spoke of a uh, town hall meeting about a month or so ago. Mayor Worth, were you there? No. Thank you. No, you weren't. You were invited. Contrary to your platitudes and to your cutesy titles, we are not one Bay Area. We are dozens of individual communities. We choose to live in these communities, and we want to have some local control over these communities. We do not... I don't want unelected members of some group dictating the number of units to be built in my town. And I'm sure I speak for other towns also. Individual citizens choose to live in their community. They elect their people. Look at the 4th of July celebrations in individual communities. They all reflect local control and local pride. We don't want to be told by some strangers how our town is going to be built and what it's going to look like. California's economy is anemic. People are fleeing California right now. How is this plan going to help? Where are the jobs? Where are the jobs with these houses? How is it good for the environment? How is it good for the infrastructure? How is it good for our schools, our police, our fire, who are already overworked? California is already ramming through high-speed rail, cylindron rails. It's a joke. Now they're trying to ram through. Now, ABAG 
and MTC are trying to ram through this Plan Bay area. Again, a joke. Give the local voters a chance to decide. It's time for you to stand up for your constituents. Yeah. 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 Thank you, and not sell them out. What is, what is the rush? Do we have to pass? Do we have to pass the plan before we know what's in it? Yeah. Hi, my name is Tom Collins. I've lived in Martinez now for about ten years. I oppose this this plan, this one barrier plan. I oppose it. I ask that you extend the voting to another ninety days. I also oppose this force fed of socialism and that's all that's all I have to say. Chris Engel. <clears throat> Good evening, my name is Chris Engel and I'm an uh, Arinda resident. In February of this year, MTC's executive director, Steve Heminger, told the public the forecast for buying and improving their beautiful new headquarters, complete with a $3 million atrium that was added after the fact, was off by just $48 million. By the way, I wonder how many atriums we'll see in these stack and pack projects. The price tag went from $167 million to $215 million, just a 30% mistake on the cost of the building. The Bureau of State Audits said the building is expected to lose $14 to $20 million over the next 30 years, and that's a conservative estimate. And Heminger joked, I consider that a good day's work. Amazing how Mr. Heminger thinks it's funny to joke about under-budgeting with the public's money. What's my point about the building as it relates to MTC and ABAG and Plan Bay Area? As an unelected collection of officials and staffers, you have created alternative modeling assumptions completely out of line with the traditional method of forecasting population growth using net migration and birth death adjustments. You have purported to be able to forecast growth for the next 30 odd years, something not even a Wall Street forecaster would be bold enough to attempt. Original ABAG estimates for the number of new units were needed, uh, needed were almost 40% higher. They were a million units and now 660,000 units. And that was due in large part to improperly accounting for the reabsorption of existing and ongoing numbers of foreclosures. Your forecasts are wildly out of line with the Department of Finance's projections. In Contra Costa alone, your numbers differ by 13%. Expert reports that show that people have actually been migrating out of California in droves since about 1990 due to high taxes on transportation, individuals and businesses, increased density, and higher than average unemployment. You're increasing housing supply at exactly the wrong time as California has the highest number and percent of all U.S. baby boomers who will be retiring between 2012 and 2030, rushing to get these massive subsidies of 300 to 500,000 per unit and crimping demand and putting downward pressure on home prices. I'm almost finished. Even the Contra Costa County Transportation Authority, the Congestion Management Agency, charged with distributing One Bay Area grant monies, balked at Plan Bay Area's premises at a Feb 15, 2012 meeting, citing that changes in regional land use patterns offer a relatively small contribution to the overall strategy for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and called your population Thank forecast you. anything but constrained and highly speculative. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Peter Singleton. Well, this isn't a hearing on the draft EIR. I, I wanted to point out that one of the gravest deficiencies in the environmental review process is, is a sham process with a predetermined conclusion. And with that in mind, I'd like to share with the public here where Plan B area actually came from. The plan itself on page three says that it comes from SB 375 and that it, the plan's policy elements were developed w uh, by consultation and through the input of the public, the Bay Area uh, citizens. Uh, this is not entirely correct. Plan Bay Area, in all essential uh, policy elements, came from the Compact for Sustainable Bay Area that was developed, it, it was released July 29, 1999, the draft plan, that's 14 years ago, by the Bay Area Alliance, Alliance for Sustainable Development. And that is, uh, the Bay Area Alliance was a collection of, uh, a coalition of very powerful corporate interests 
non-governmental organizations, and it was run by ABAG and MTC. But each policy element of Plan B area, so the need to live in high-density housing, the need to take transit, the requirement that all cities be demographically even and that we need to move forward toward regional governance, those were all part of the draft compact. The only thing that's missing from the draft compact is anything about greenhouse gas emissions or climate change because that rationale had not been dis discovered. Um, so it's not entirely correct for the plan to say on page three that it comes from SB 375. Actually, SB 375 comes from the compact. And further, um, the plan does not, did not come, the policy elements in the plan did not come from the public whatsoever. Thank you. My name is James Bennett. I am a businessman and an activist from Sonoma County. I'm a part of the Post Sustainability Institute, which is lodging a um, legal uh, case against this tyranny. I've also had to teach myself to publish a newspaper to tell my fellow citizens about this plan. Now, it's very easy to figure out why the citizens don't know about the plan. It's because if they did and understood its ramifications, they'd be sharpening their pitchforks. <laughs> now, I think we all know that the UN is not a warm and fuzzy peacekeeping organization like we thought when we were kids. It is the organization and the vehicle, along with an alphabet of other NGOs and coalitions and agencies that carry out directive and synthesize consensus for their totalitarian tyranny. Spelled out in a complete plan for complete control called UN Agenda 21 Sustainable Development. This is the hardscape as dictated by these globalists. This is starting to remind me of another part of history around 1930 that didn't go very well. <laughs> Forgive me, containing the people next to rail, taking away their guns, fluoridating the populace, indulging in propaganda, and indoctrinating our children. It's like a duck. If it looks like a duck and walks like one and quacks, and it has all of its earmarks, it's a duck. <laughs> now these globalists employ a postulate that works real good. It works good on an individual surf. It works good on somebody in ag. It works good on Petaluma. It works good on Portugal. You provide for their impoverishment, and then in the wake of that, you say, if you play ball our way, we'll give you money. And they go along. Thank you, Well, James. make no mistake, there's a lot they want us to go along with. Thank you, James. And we will not. My name is Dave Ehrlich. I'm from San Leandro, California, originally from Lancaster, California, where this was implemented uh, about six years ago. That's why I moved. Um, we still have our, uh, our uh, mixed-use housing. They're empty in Lancaster. The bottom floors are. The uh, affordable housing is well, well occupied. I'm going to take off where the gentleman in front of me left, Agenda 21, the globalists, the plan is uh, something that you are implementing. I know you've all been on notice about it. They've been fighting it up here for years. So, with the police here, maybe we should, I don't know, talk about arrest for treason. Because this has been fought for years and years and years. In fact, there's been city councils that have been, pre have been presented with misprisions of treason. That's as soon as you're notified of the treason, you must cease and assist it. Desist and stop the treason against the Constitution of the United States. And again, he's right, the 1930s. My grand grandparents were from Russia. Well, actually, I'm sorry, from Poland. They left just before, just before uh, he decided to take over all the businesses. Um, they took away the guns. They uh, moved everybody by tracks. There was a great high-speed rail, I think, between Auschwitz and Poland somewhere there. Um, it's, 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 it's all there. If you guys, I, I know you guys have looked up Agenda 21 because I've seen the videos from years before I came up here. <laughs> Delphi technique is great, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's in the manifesto. Let's read it. Once we learn the language, and everybody in this room knows the language, the language of dialogue and collaborative and stakeholders, which we are not the stakeholders, obviously. 
um, we can we can decipher it, and uh, and we can beat this because there's a whole playbook. The, the the globalists put it out there, and they let us know what they're going to do before they do it. So we are uh, we are smart. We will we will defeat this. Um, you know, I'm an electrician by trade and, a, and an operative by, by life, uh, an operative against the globalists. And this is a battle I'm going to take on along with uh, a, lot of other, a lot of other folks in the, uh, in the crowd here. You've managed to stir up the right and the left. Good job. You're bringing us all together. That's what we need. Thank you. My name's uh, Terry Thompson from Unincorporated Alamo. This is all about central planning. Didn't work in the Soviet Union, and it's not going to work here. All right. I, Julie, uh, you said ABAG was consist or composed of elected officials. I didn't vote for you. I didn't vote for any of the ladies up here. There are three kinds of government. We have city government. We have uh, county government. We have state government. There's no such thing as regional government. Regional government is, is non-existent. It's illegitimate. If you want public input, you say that's what, uh, why we're here tonight, uh, there's one way to get public input. That's to put this for a vote. You have a 1,300-page EIR, which almost guarantees no one's going to read it. Now, maybe that was a design. So uh, as I recall, I went to a meeting down in Oakland, and you had a big screen up, and you had a bunch of options, and or various uh, 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 options of what uh, what you could do or what you're deciding on and it seemed to me there was uh, one option we could choose to be hung another we could have a firing squad or we could take lethal injection or maybe death by a thousand cuts and I think that's where we are now uh, there was one option though that I did like my personal favorite it's called no project and so I would love <laughs> I said, uh, you know, we want local control, and my wife just told me, you mean we don't want loco? <laughs> so um, I'd urge all of, all of my friends here in the audience to demand of their cities, their towns, get out of ABAG. We're doing this now uh, over in Danville. They're going to agendize it. Corte Madeira has already done this. I recommend that all of you get out your pitchforks and your torches and go to your town councils and get us out of ABAG. Yes. Uh, yes, next is Chris, then Lenore Krause, then Liz Freilich, then S.P. Callister. I cleared the aisle. It's Chris Pareja. Pareja. I was born in Richmond and I live in Hayward. That's a J. Okay. I oppose the Bay Area plan. It talks about the three E's of uh, planning uh, being environment, economy, and equity. And specifically, equity is called out as being particularly important. And I'd like to clarify something for the designers of the One Bay Area plan, and that is that just because someone's a minority doesn't mean they need assistance from the government to be equal to others. Yeah. That's a racist philosophy, and it's insulting. The One Bay Area Plan also highlights the desire to put high-density or multifamily homes near mass transit. And part of the justification cited is that we're, we have growing demographics of Asian and Hispanic households. And on page 33 of the plan, you basically say brown people like to live in multifamily homes. As an Asian that looks Mexican, I'm offended twice. Multi-generational households may be partially cultural, but also partially economically driven. The lack of high-paying jobs, the ones being chased out of the Bay Area, is a large factor for reliance on multi-family homes and dependence on mass transit. The current economy is driving more families into multi-generational housing arrangements and roommate situations. There's currently an excess inventory in the housing market and people continue to leave the area and the state. New federal and state taxes will continue to make it difficult for these families to purchase homes here. These are all factors brought on by um, a difficult business climate exacerbated by excessive taxes and regulations, not just by brown people liking to band together and live in the same home or neighborhood. 
The, the plans have highlighted retail and restaurant jobs in walkable communities. These are typically low-paying, entry-level jobs. It's almost as if you believe the majority of brown people want to work in restaurants and retail. <laughs> You've offended me again. Especially since these jobs are statistically occupied by teenagers and middle-income families or other co currently employed individuals needing additional income. They're typically not taken by members of lower-income families or people needing a single job with a lifestyle supporting income. Not only that, the priority development areas are often in polluted, undesirable parts of town, especially in the inner cities, and this desire to put high numbers of income disadvantaged families in unhealthy environments is criminal. The One Barrier Plan is not going to make minorities more equal. It's going to trap them in slums and reduce their, their chances to get out. Thank you. Here's my request for you. If you really care about equity, please stop adding amenities to the plantation and free the workers to pursue their own versions of happiness. Yeah. Yeah. Lenore Krauss, followed by Liz Freilich, followed by S.P. Callister, followed by Eliza Pursuit. My name is Lenore Krauss and I'm from Pleasant Hill. In this state, we think of the levels of government to be city, in my case Pleasant Hill, county, Contra Costa, state, California, federal, the United States of America. ABAG and MTC are like another level of government that we do not need and we do not want. When ABAG and MTC tell me how to live and where to live, they are enabled with way too much power. When they blackmail cities into doing their command by withholding transportation funds from the city, if the city does not do as ABAG and MTC demand, this is a level of power I cannot comprehend. If we would have to have this level of government, we should at least be able to elect the officials of this government directly. We elect our representative to other governmental bodies in the state directly. You might say to me that city councils and other government bodies select their duly elected officials to serve on subcommittees, etc. This is true, but none of these subcommittees has the power that has been given to ABAG and MTC. I bring this issue up because Ms. Karen Mitchoff, our Contra Costa County representative here, in questions recently posed to her implied or said that she, uh, that the elected, that the officials of ABAG and MTC are elected directly. This is not true. The elected officials of our various cities should be the ones to make zoning decisions, etc. Our city officials should not allow this power grab by ABAG and MTC. It is time for us to withdraw from ABAG and MTC. Yes. Freilich, followed by S.P. Callister, followed by Eliza Pesowit and John Chapman. Thank you. I too oppose the Bay, Plare, Bay, Bay, Plare, Bay, Plan, area, Bay area Plan and follow what others have said, particularly about local control. And so I really am concerned when I read two things that confuse me in your number six more questions, I'm not supposed to worry about local control because you indicate state legislation is explicit that neither ABAG nor MTC has the legal authority to supersede the land use authorities of cities and counties. But then I have this form of the regional housing needs allocation which tells me how many more housing units are going to come into my city of Concord and I think I don't have a choice in that. I'm really concerned, my second point is, that this is just a reaction to the over-stimulation of what we've seen of the alarmists about global warming. So therefore we have to go back to AB 32, which was the companion bill to SB 375. And I think there has been, in the interim of these years, much more to be concerned about, but not on the alarmist side on the side that we aren't having global warming. So I think what we're trying to produce here is something that is based on faulty documentation and data. And recently we have even seen this information, maybe not all of us have seen it, but there are two things just quickly I want to remind to tell you have been noted in the media. The, in the Australian, recently, it said, there's been a 20-year hiatus in rising temperatures. 
and it has climate scientists puzzled. <laughs> then in The Economist of March, there was a lengthy article in which it said, if climate scientists were credit rating agencies, climate sensitivity would be on negative watch, but not yet downgraded. So I would urge cities to withdraw from ABEG. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Susan Callister. I live in Lafayette. Um, I'm a member of the Happy Valley Improvement Association Board and part of the Lafayette Homeowners Council. I was a little bit concerned at the beginning of this evening when someone up there said that this, this particular thing was going to be going through in July. I do remember smart growth about nine or ten years ago attending a meeting and thinking, oh my god, I hope this doesn't go through, and it didn't. So I think a lot of the people that were up there this evening that asked you to sort of stand up to the plate and put this up for a vote, and I'm sure there's money to be found in some of the grant money that's dangled around the communities that are designated PTAs, and you use that for a, a vote in Contra Costa County. The EIR and your plan have some unrealistic forecasts for jobs, households, and you know, you've used any kind of independent analysis. You know, I believe there's global warming. I believe we need to have housing for everybody in our community and help those that need help. But I don't believe that you're the decider of that. We are, our communities are, our downtown plan, our general plan, not this one Bay Area thing. So I urge you to listen to some of the people that spoke tonight and put it up for a vote of the people. And then a second thing on the PDA, at least for our community, it seems though our staff gets grant money dangled at them. So last year we had our streets torn up for almost a year to get pink sidewalks and some trees torn down. And I don't know why we did it. It did put some people to work, but not for very long, and the outcome wasn't good. So. But there's something I think we must really think carefully about. The big issues we face, the big planning issues we face, housing, transportation, air quality, open space protection, these are all regional issues. And if you look at 110 jurisdictions and expect them to solve these problems alone, it won't happen and we'll get into a much, much worse situation. We have to have a way to do this together because it's 110 jurisdictions working, that need to work together, 109, okay. So, I like the attempt of what this plan is trying to do, to find a way to work together to solve the problems. I also like the plan because it's an important step to implementing AB 32, which was brought to us as administration and a Republican governor. It's a good bill. It's, it's, it's uh, worth fighting for. I like the plan because it provides housing choices for a variety of people. And particularly I like it when it proposes to build close to transit so that people don't have to own a car for every family member. They have choices, they can take their car or they can take transit. I like the plan because it holds the limit on urban sprawl for the next 30 years. There's, there's room enough, the studies have shown, to build within the existing 110 cities we don't have to push out further. I love the plan because it protects wildlife and working family farms. And local family farms are a really important national security issue because without local food, then what happens is a geopolitical event occurs. And finally, I like it because it brings clean air and water. Thank you. Legler, followed by Jordan Fruchtman, followed by Barbara Hodgkinson, followed by Pam Jones. Hello. Um, I'm a, just a little old senior living in Arunda for 37 years. Uh, I enjoy the city. I enjoy the rural atmosphere. I find the plan Bay Area to be flawed, incomplete, and needs to be rewritten. So therefore, I hope that it is not adopted in its present form. And let me give you some specific things. Number one, the plan called for the same demographic characteristics among all the cities. I don't think we want to do that. We don't want sameness. We want individuality. The, the, second, the second thing the report failed to mention and deal with, that's single family housing. 
that's a big source of housing. And it should be integrated to, into any housing plan. And it was not incorporated. Not the notion that people want to live life, spend their whole life in a high density housing is unrealistic to say the least. And third, the DOF, Department of Finance, has statisticians to project population. ABAG has statisticians to project population. They totally disagree. Why don't we use one or the other? Why don't we use the state since it's been around for so long and it's very respected? So we should use that as a base rather than, you know, is the ABAG statisticians better than the state statisticians? Okay. Uh, one a suggestion, since you're having housing mandates, there ought to be a way to have offsets to the state mandates. And the offsets could include such things as no land available for building. Could be that an offset could be given for large houses because they have many children and family. An offset could be given to uh, senior housing, and that would reduce it. And the, I have one last point, and then I'm done. The last point is cost-benefit analysis. There has to be a cost-benefit. We're spending public money. We ought to do it in a very uh, reasonable and wisely way. So therefore, I hope you uh, don't approve the plan as it is written. Thank, Thank you, Bill. Next is Jordan Fruckman, followed by Barbara Hodgkinson, followed by Pam Jones, followed by Eric Stuffman. Hi, thank you so much for uh, listening to all of our comments and for being here tonight and spending so much time. Um, I uh, grew up here in the Bay Area, I'm 31 years old, and uh, you know I came here because I wanted to tell you all about um, my experience here, going to summer camp at the Lafayette Reservoir every single summer, being able to experience the nature and wildlife there, um, and, and be in those spaces. Um, and now I've been married for two and a half years, and uh, my wife and I are ready to start a family and settle down. Uh, we've been saving up to buy a home, and the only place my wife will look is here in, uh, in the Walnut Creek area. She uh, was just shopping, unfortunately, for me. Um, and, uh, you know, in this awesome uh, district here. And so, uh, you know, we're really excited, but it's really, not only is it incredibly hard to find affordable homes for us, but, um, you know, to another gentleman's point, that, like, we do want to live near a park. We would love to live near transportation hubs so that we can actually use that to get to work instead of having to be stuck in traffic. So that would be really a fantastic thing. And I came here because I wanted to tell you about that. I want to tell you about the hope that I have for open space and connected biking routes and affordable housing for people. And unfortunately, what I heard was talk about Nazis and communists and tyranny and totalitarianism. And I'm, you know, I'm a young guy in my 30s and I'm, I'm actually trying to approach this country with a lot of hope. Um, I'm hoping that we can change and we can grow together and make Walnut Creek and Contra Costa a better place for all of us to live. Um, and uh, you know, I, my, my grandparents were in the Holocaust and I wanted to say that's a completely ridiculous thing that I take offense to and I hope that we can really all come together to make a better Contra Costa together and to make this whole Bay Area a better place together. Thank you. followed by Eric Stuffman, followed by Rosa Coyer. Hi, I'm Barbara Hodgkinson. I've been a homeowner in Orinda for 30 years, and I'm a member of Orinda Watch. Uh, the ABAG vision is contrary to the semi-rural village character of Orinda. Orinda homeowners and taxpayers cherish its quiet suburban nature and do not want the city to be transformed. I personally reject the social engineering agenda upon which ABAG's uh, vision is based. Uh, I think it's far too radical. I do not believe that all people should live in densely packed, multi-story attached units in urban centers rather than in single family homes. I do not believe that car use should be discouraged in favor of transit. I believe that car use should be made cleaner and greener and emission free. I do not believe that all suburban downtowns should be rezoned from multi-story housing and ground floor commercial. But I do believe that Arinda must get out of A-bag. I've been coming to these Plan Bay Area meetings since March 2011. 
Um, you guys always look so bored when people talk about freedom. And then when they talk about riding bike trails and taking bags places, you look so excited. <laughs> it always, just always cracks me up. I couldn't help but comment on it. Um, the frequently asked questions. Since March 2011, I've been asking a frequently asked question, and I've never gotten the an answer. And that is, why do you only have one population number? It behooves me that you can't come up with maybe a low, medium, and high number like most people would do when they're trying to transform an entire region. You know, just guessing a population number doesn't mean it's actually going to happen. Like we're going to grow by, I don't know what it is now, but it started I think about 3 million. And back in March 2011, when I questioned the people, they looked perplexed that we weren't growing and we continue to decline here in California. And you never look at the numbers. You never take another look. And I can't believe you sit there every one of these meetings and look like you care when you don't even care enough to look, take another look at population numbers. That's an important aspect when you're talking about changing a region. So if you would, finally, please, at least put it on the frequently asked questions that it's been asked a dozen times. You don't need, I guess you're never gonna give the answer, so at least put it on the questions. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Eric Stuffman and I'm a resident of Arinda uh, for the last uh, three and a half years. My wife has lived in Arinda all her life and um, we love it there. Uh, we love it as it is uh, right now. Um, and um, I have a couple uh, points to make. I guess at this point I'm echoing some uh, earlier points, uh, but so be it. Um, so I just found out about this six weeks ago, um, just from a friend of mine. And um, as I learn more and more, I'm, I'm pretty concerned. And I talk to people uh, in my daily life, and I have yet to meet anybody uh, outside of Arinda Watch, who I have a friend on, uh, who knows anything about this. And so how could something with such far-reaching implications be put upon us without our say in the matter? Um, so I, I guess I'm echoing earlier uh, points that it just seems uh, right and democratic that we be allowed to vote. And at the very least, um, well, the, the wrong way to go about it seems to have only a 45-day uh, window for public comment. Um, as it pertains to Arinda specifically, my wife and I moved there specifically for the, the semi-rural character and the schools, because um, we have two young children. And uh, I'm concerned about the impact on, on both those things, and it seems you know, obvious that there would be a, a big detriment um, to both those things, um, and hence property values. I think uh, we can achieve a lot of other goals, such as bike paths and um, uh, green environment and, and clean water, but uh, the idea of, of having a, a standard um, cookie cutter approach to all the different uh, cities um, doesn't respect the individual aspects of those cities. That's why I chose Orinda. Um, I like other aspects about other cities and I like to go visit those cities for those reasons, but uh, I, don't, I don't want this happening to, to Orinda. I'm Rosa Corey with the Post Sustainability Institute. That's postsustainabilityinstitute.org. We will be suing to stop Plan Bay Area. With your help, with your help, we need funds for this suit. So please go to postsustainabilityinstitute.org and help us collect the funds for this lawsuit. Plan Bay Area violates the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution, taking property rights without just compensation. By the creation of priority development areas, this plan restricts 80% of residential development and 66% of commercial development to just a few small areas of your city until the year 2040. If your property is outside of the PDAs, and 96% of the property is outside, you will likely not be able to expand or build your building and you will not be paid 
for this loss. Plan Bay Area violates the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution, the Equal Protection Clause. Owners of properties in the priority development areas will receive development permits at a rate of approximately 80 times more than owners of property outside of priority development areas. Plan Bay Area violates voter-approved urban growth boundary ordinances because the priority development areas are within the urban growth boundaries but are much smaller. They are restricted areas. They are in violation of ordinances that clearly state that development must be encouraged out to the limits of city services. These ordinances are found throughout the Bay Area and cannot be changed without a vote of the people. I say we do not want a vote for regional government. We do not want this plan. We will sue you. We will stop this plan. Help you, us Papa. sue this plan. Thank you. Help us sue this plan. Post Sustainability Institute dot org. Thank you. by Steve Heron, followed by Dr. Cheryl Morgan, followed by Chet Martin. Hi, my name is Tom Morehouse. I'm an Orinda resident. Yeah. We live in a very small, sleepy community of 17,000 people, about 4,000 houses. I would say it's very sleepy tonight because about half of Orinda seems to be here. And I think we're here because we're all concerned. I heard about it, as the fellow mentioned earlier, about six weeks ago, we've seen a lot in the papers. And I came here to be educated. And I think it's really unfortunate because I've been educated by all my neighbors. I have not been educated one word by any of you. Thank you. Cheryl Morgan, by Chet Martin, and then by Kay Tokarud. My name is Steve Heron. I'm a resident of Orinda. Uh, before this meeting started, I was reading down through the FAQs, seeing how a lot of this, the intent was to reduce pollution, traffic congestion, and so on. I thought, well, that's nice. Let's assume for a moment that we do build multi-unit housing in Orinda to try and fix some of this, which I don't agree with. I don't believe in social engineering. But let's assume we did that. Would anyone in Orinda move to those homes? No, that's why we live the way we do. So that would mean other folks from other communities would have to move there to fill those properties. We are a small bedroom community that really doesn't have any business per se, except for a few small retail establishments in our downtown area, which is not very big. In other words, there's really no jobs there for new people to come in and sustain themselves and be able to pay for their properties. So what would they have to do? They would have to go and leave to some other area to work their jobs. In other words, they'd have to commute. So the objectives, the FAQs of reducing pollution and traffic congestion would in fact increase because there aren't any jobs here. They would be actually, so how dumb is that? <laughs> so it doesn't seem like it would really be solving anything. And in fact, as I said, it would actually increase pollution, congestion, and so on. Not to mention the increased attendance in schools that are, are not equipped to handle that. The additional drain on city services and so on. So I, I look at it and I think, well, who does this really benefit? Probably nobody here, I don't think. Maybe a few developers and all, but um, I really don't think that it's something that we need. Thank you very much. Um, as you guys know, especially one or two people sitting up here, I am a teacher and you need to consider yourselves about to be educated. Socialism is Planning to generate uniformity and to eliminate individuality. That is the textbook definition of socialism, and that is what your plan is, without question. Socialism 
is a failed political system. And if you don't believe me, I spent the summer in the Ukraine. They failed. They're starving to death because they were socialists. Okay? That is the future for the Bay Area if you pass this. Your plan is socialism. So are you the local Politburo? Are you now the ones in charge of deciding where people will work, where people will live, how much they'll eat, what kind of health care plans they get? Because if you are, you need to join the Obama regime. I think you already have. <laughs> and if you don't believe me that this is socialism, look at the few people in this room who actually support your document. Unions. Political, liberal students. That's it. And, basically, the fringe. The majority of the people in this room don't approve your plan. The majority of, of people in the Bay Area, if they knew of your plan, would not approve of your plan. And the fact that you refuse to educate anybody about it, the fact that you're trying to push this through Obama style, trying to push this plan through in 90 days when nobody can read the document, including yourselves, in 90 days, you're going on the Pelosi plan of you can't read it until you pass it. So again, I urge you not to pass this if you consider yourself Americans because this is a very un-American plan. Thank you. Chet Martin, then Kate Tokaru, then Alex Flagg, then Glenn Z. My name is Chet Martin. I reside in Dorinda. I've been there 12 years. My wife's been there over 45. I'm a retired patent attorney, volunteer in the eighth grade uh, middle school, San Francisco for a few years. I was a trustee for two years for a local deceased family. And I'm now a student of ABAG. My concern is the large unreimbursed cost impact on cities such as Orinda, the impact of the RHNA and housing element process on cities. This impact was increased by a March 30th, 2005 decision of the Commission on State Mandates. Per that decision, cities will no longer be reimbursed for their costs working on the RHNI and housing element process. In a service matters issue, this is on the website. You can look at service matters. There's tens and tens. In that issue on July, August 2005, ABAG commented on that decision and said, quote, without reimbursement from the state, ABAG and other COGS, and that means cities such as Arinda, are simply not in a financial position to perform the next RHNA process. A question for you then is what has ABAC done or will it do up front before a city's infill is built in their city to assist the city's abilities to work on the RN, RHNI and housing element tasks. There was no mention of any such financial assistance in service matter issues after 2005. For example, will ABAG stop requiring cities to pay a membership fee to ABAG to partly offset this uh, decision? For clarification, I do not mean the so-called incentives that could be paid to a city after completion of low-income housing. Lastly, I reserve the right to file with ABAG, MTC, other comments in writing and without limit on the time I take to write them and without a limit on the number of pages. Thank you, Thank you. Chet. It's my we, protest we against limiting two minutes. Thank and concerning you. air pollution, the mitigation standard Chet, and best practices you. was to locate balconies away from the polluting highway. Thank you, Chet. Your time is up. Kay Tokarud, I'm also with Post Sustainability Institute and a property owner in Contra Costa County. Uh, the Plan Bay area is primary, primarily a land use plan, yet there is no mention of property rights anywhere in any of the documents. It's as if those rights never existed. 
the primary function of Plan Bay area is to strip private property rights away from most property owners. In the rural areas, they take away all development rights. Only farming will be allowed, so no houses will be built, no employment centers will be built, unless it's farming, farming only. No compensation has been mentioned for any of those uh, property owners. You're essentially taking a conservation easement on all rural land without paying a penny for it. In suburban areas, in area, urbanized areas that are not in the PDAs, you're taking most property rights away from all of those people without a penny's payment and compensation for their lost property values. Now, in the PDAs, we find out that eminent domain is coming back. Even though redevelopment was taken away, a new form of eminent domain powers are, will be bestowed on every locality participating in the Plan Bay area. There's no citizen oversight groups mentioned in that, and that should have been coupled with this plan because your plan has no funding mechanism whatsoever for getting the new development built, although it positively strips away property rights from all property owners in the entire nine county region. You must pay for these damages. That's why we're taking you to court. And we will claim these damages and require you to pay us for what you're stripping away from us. And your plan is 100% in accordance with United Nations Agenda 21 that has a private property ownership altogether, and this is one giant step toward taking those rights away, and we will stop you with every ounce of our being. Thank, Thank you. you. Next is Alex Flagg, followed by Glenn Z, followed by Igor Skaradov, followed by Joel Ramos. Hi, my name is Alex Flagg. I live in Lafayette. It's my first time here. I considered myself pretty nonpartisan with regard to all this. Uh, so I'm learning a lot tonight. Um, I don't have any ax to grind specifically. Is, I, I'm confused though, is this the committee? This is MTA and ABAG? This is, I, I just, uh, sorry, but I, okay, wow. Sorry that you guys have to take all the heat, but I guess you can bring it back. I know, but they're not all here, I guess is the point. Not everyone's here, sorry. So I, I rewrote my thoughts here a few different times because a lot of things have changed and, and I came up with four things that stick out in my mind. Number one was communication. Number two was schools. Number, one, number three were the options that people seem to have or not have. And number four were the broader community. And as I said, only recently I've heard about this, these, issue at hand, these issues at hand. Um, and upon hearing about it, I asked, like another fellow here, did an informal poll of his local friends and I was shocked. Nobody knew anything about what's going on here. So while everyone in this room, hats off to you for both sides for being involved. It's just not something that a lot of people have been able to pay attention to. And I think that that personally is a failure of communication in a lot of ways. And if people in Contra Costa or even around here welcome all their thoughts, you'd need a room 100 times this size to get the, to get the understanding of how people really feel. So I think that that's a problem that people don't really understand. I know you guys have been working on it for a long time and on both sides. but. Um, failure to communicate. Uh, and if there's a failure to communicate, I think that something like that um, should be put out as a vote. I mean, I'm kind of shocked that this sort of thing needs to be handled in the Marriott in the middle of the night. Um, I think it should be put for a vote. I mean, let people make their minds up. That's how we do things around here, right? Um, number two failure I'd like to address was kind of one that's more specific, and it's the lack of research on our already uh, financially, financially struggling schools. I'm serving on a task force for the Lafayette School District that was formed to help ends meet financially, and it's, it's a struggle. Um, increasing density of these areas without a social, social or financial plan will damage these schools even further. I didn't see anything that looked like a plan. I'll try to sum up quickly, fast here. Um, finally, no, no issue to vote, yes or no. Uh, I, it seems clear to me that people should be able to do that. And, I, and the, my final point is the broader community. And I appreciate that there's some people from San Francisco here and in the broader area. I lived in San Francisco for 10 years. Uh, I've stopped voting on all the issues that are local to the Haight-Ashbury area. I appreciate that. 
um, but it sounds to me quite a bit like this is a local decision. It is a broader implications, but um, I also Thank didn't you, have Alex. a car till I was 25 or 30. Thank but you. Zipcar came around, and I think that this is a local situation. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Next is Glenn Z, and I can't even figure out what your handwriting says. <laughs> uh, my name is Glenn Zemanian. Um, I'm a resident of Lafayette. Um, I learned about um, uh, ABAG and MTE uh, through reading in the paper problems, at, at least in my opinion, of high density, high packed uh, um, apartment style housing getting crammed down on Danville. I've seen the same effects. Um, coming into Lafayette, and I, I think that that has helped me really be clear in my opposition for um, one plan Bay Area. Um, I've also learned good information from uh, Arenda Watch and, and others out there in looking at this. Um, in my at least review, I think there's little analysis for what high density will have on our property values for those of us that are living in homes now that have made that choice. And this is something that needs to be looked at, and I don't think it has been clearly um, stated, at least in what's been published by your organization so far. Um, secondly, why, zero, why is there zero or near zero funding for schools, police, fire protection on this form of stack and pack? Um, lastly, um, I don't know if it's 100% true, but in looking at some of the data that was handed out here, it's a little shocking that your government organization, in coming up with these plans, and at least in my belief, are paying some of the salaries to your guys' staff that seem outrageous, at least to me. Maybe others here are making um, two to three hundred thousand dollars, but it's fairly outrageous, in my opinion. I don't know how many here are really making those kinds of money. So. In summary, I would ask for reasonableness and looking at balance, and I'm not under the belief that um, your plan makes sense at this point, at least for my vote. I'd say put it to a vote, as been said before, and let individuals decide based on the needs of their local communities that they chose to live in. Thank you. Next is Igor Skarada, followed by Joel Ramos, followed by Winton Mather, followed by Mark Micarada. Good evening. My name is Igor Skardoff. I live in Martinez. I've lived there since 64. I love this area. And uh, I just want to point out that one of the reasons uh, this area is so good is because we owe a debt to visionaries who have come before us, who have seen past uh, their noses and found ways to uh, try to make this a better place and then try to keep it as good as it was and maybe improve it as much. Without them, our bay would have been filled in by now. Our, we would have no parks. We would look like Los Angeles. We need regional planning. We need coordinated planning. We need to integrate the different plans for the specific areas into a regional framework that makes sense so that the plans don't counteract each other but complement each other. Thoughtful, transparent, and inclusive planning is what we need. And I think uh, this meeting is probably a pretty good example of that. I've certainly seen and heard plenty of diversity. I've seen and heard nobody being intimidated by standing in front of a government agency uh, and uh, being afraid to have their say. And so uh, I would like to encourage you to hang in there, take all this under advisement, work with it, try to work out all the various things that uh, have been brought to your attention, and uh, let's get this thing uh, put together in a way that works for all of us and satisfies these needs that you're trying to address. Thank you. followed by Winton Mather, followed by Mike Arata, followed by Nancy Schaefer. Good evening, Mayor Wirth. Uh, I, my name is Joel Ramos. I'm a um, resident of San Francisco, but I grew up here in Contra Costa County, went to Monte Diablo High School. My family still lives here in the county. Uh, my parents have been priced out. They can no longer afford to live here. Uh, we came here in the 70s 
My father worked here for about 25 years, uh, slugging back and forth between an unincorporated part of uh, Contra Costa County all the way to San Francisco where he got a job. When we came here in the 70s, I remember pulling up and driving literally till we qualified for my family to have a home that we could live in. We started in San Francisco and couldn't find a place that was affordable until we all the way got all the way out to an unincorporated part of Contra Costa County. So my father was part of the traffic for the past 35 years going back and forth um, to San Francisco. And uh, I thought that it was always so tragic that he had to live so far and spend so much time away from us. Um, uh, I work for an organization called Transform. and. We're working, we're hoping that we can work with you to find solutions so that we can actually get the affordable housing that we need. And housing not just for low income folks, but regular working folks like my father, like my brother who's right now building BART uh, out to uh, Oakley or um, Pittsburgh, but is, uh, has not been able to afford to um, hold on to his home. He's underwater now and is threatening being displaced as well. Uh, I grew up looking at the hills, those beautiful green hills at the foothill of Mount Diablo, and now um, I see houses being built up there because people can't afford to live closer to uh, where they would like to, which is accessible to transportation. And uh, my wife is right now is, a, um, is working as an accountant in San Francisco for a real estate firm where people are paying a million dollars in cash for homes there. Uh, and it's just becoming a matter of time before people like the young lady, the nice young lady that helped us find this room, who's been working at this hotel for six years and can't afford to live in Long Creek despite she would like to, but she said that she can't afford it and has to commute from Brentwood every day. So this leads to more and more freeway sprawl and more and more lanes that we hope will convert into high occupancy toll lanes and then get funding for transit instead of widening those freeways as well. Thank you so much for your time and I hope you'll work with us in the future. Thank you, Joel. You. Next is Winton Mather, followed by Mike Arata, followed by Nancy Schaefer, followed by Linda Delahunt. Yes, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Winton Mather. Uh, I lived in Arenda over 40 years. I was a co-chairman of the Arenda Incorporation Study Committee way back when, so uh, Arenda is now a, a burgeoning city, as you know. I'm reading from the Arenda website. It says, Arenda's general plan embodies the community's long-term vision for the future, and uh, they adopted the general plan. Uh, my version, having worked for IBM for my career, is if it's not broken, don't fix it. And um, the, uh, the Arenda community is a uh, supervised, so to speak, by the Arenda community, by the um, Arenda City Council, and uh, they have done very well, and that's an elected body, which you all know, and therefore should stay as it is. Um, as a non-threatening speaker, I would just say that uh, uh, your ideas are interesting, uh, worthwhile to listen to, but not to be used. And, uh, <laughs> And we should definitely extend the time frame for people to uh, have their capability looked at and understood much better than your short-term time frame. Okay, Mike Arata, followed by Nancy Schaefer, followed by Linda Delahunt, followed by Adrian Harris. Well, good evening. Uh, from the, and I'm Mike Arata from Danville. From the outset, and despite Mrs. Pierce's recent editorial assurances to the contrary, Plan Bay Area has been a manipulative Potemkin exercise designed to paper over the internationalist connections you spell out yourselves in 2003's final version of a so-called compact for a sustainable Bay Area. Your workshops of the last two years situated your vastly overcompensated employees and other shills at tables of concerned citizens in order to steer discussions in the direction of a manufactured pre-planned consensus. AB or SB 375, which your employees themselves likely wrote for Daryl Steinberg, pretends that local jurisdictions need not adopt a sustainable uh, community strategy, that they need not cooperate in advancing the regional agenda, and that they retain authority over land use decisions. But meanwhile, and in fact, your grossly inflated RENA allocations, glaringly disproportionate with recent growth patterns and real-world housing needs projections, 
divide communities while threatening draconian enforcement for jurisdictions which don't cooperate. It's a case of play ball or we'll be around to break your kneecaps. In collaboration with outfits like the similarly overpaid Contra Cost Transportation Authority, you continue to pretend that you are addressing traffic congestion, though less than 50% of Measure J's sales tax addresses auto traffic needs, and though MTC itself projected 82% of future trips by 2025 will still be by auto, with something like 6 to 8% by transit. Nonetheless, Contra Costa Transportation Authority is now pushing for a sales tax increase. If you care genuinely about citizen input, then you will extend your comment period before adoption, allow for longer than two minute comments by knowledgeable citizens, and arrange for formal debates in each county modeled after the one now scheduled in Marin County on May 30th. Meanwhile, I invite you to Danville for a debate on these issues if our town council does not itself invite you. Thank you. Thank you. followed by Linda Delahunt, followed by Adrian Harris, followed by Alvin Ziegler. Hi, I'm Nancy Schaefer. I'm a resident of Martinez. And I think I've said this before at other, uh, other of these Plan Bay Area meetings that uh, a land use planning friend of mine said once there are two problems with the American, or two things the American public doesn't like, density and sprawl. And I think that's really what we're facing here. I'm here to support the plan. Um, I think it's a great idea to tie housing, jobs, and transportation much more closely than we have. And I understand that this plan is not going to automatically go into effect. Each local jurisdiction, each city is going to have to decide how they want to implement it or if they want to implement it. And this is a carrot approach, and I support that. Um, I also like the idea of getting more housing options. Those who want to continue to live in large homes on large lots can do that. But those of us who are looking to downsize, are looking for more housing choices and be able to live closer to stores and restaurants and possibly be able to walk. I also like the idea that uh, planning for more compact development helps protect our local farms and ranches from some of the development pressures that they faced in years past. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Linda Delahunt followed by Adrian Harris, followed by Alvin Ziegler. And we only have a couple people beyond that. We are really pushing our time limit here. Hi, um, it's getting late. Uh, we've all heard so many wonderful comments. I can't believe the passion in this room. Uh, so I'm not gonna belabor um, my particular points too long because so much has been said. But I'd just like to point out that it does appear that um, the concer concerns voiced here tonight point to a real process gone awry. And uh, I believe um, you people could perhaps correct it, but I do think we're hearing about a process that's really gone awry. We're talking about a 1,300 page document, which is about to be implemented before it has been adequately shared by our citizenry. And uh, again, that points to a process that's really gone awry. The process itself needs to be revisited. I urge you, first ask citizens if they want to be a part of ABEG. That's the first question. Once you have confirmation, establish citizen oversight groups and then do individ individualized plans based on the unique uh, individual characteristics of the communities involved. Uh, if we don't do that, our, our Bay Area uh, will ultimately become um, faceless, and uh, that is not something that I think any of us want to see. So please, revisit the process. Thank you for listening. Uh, hello, I am Adrian Harris. Thank you all for uh, stepping forward to perform the underpaid jobs that you do on behalf of the public. I do appreciate that that is a form of volunteerism that can be very painful. Um, I am a senior citizen. I am the uh, founding chair of the Richmond Bicycle Pedestrian Advisory Committee, which is an advocacy group which works with the city of Richmond. I am not here to speak on behalf of my organization, however. Um, 
I uh, haven't reviewed the plan. I would agree with those who asked for a little extra time so that we can comment in writing on the plan. My representative is the, on your uh, committee is the magnificent um, John Joya, who always makes himself available to hear our opinions and brings them forward for us. And I trust he will do that in this case as well. And he is my only representative amongst all these names, which I find a little bit upsetting. Um, less than two years ago, the city of Richmond adopted its new general plan and uh, which is, was the first general plan in the state to have a public health component. And our bicycle plan, which was funded by TDA funding, Transportation Development Act funding, uh, was folded into the general plan. That's why we wanted to have a bicycle plan. And the Richmond BPAC was instrumental in advising the city on the content of the plan. Like the people I've seen here, I think, are under 35 years old. That's just my judgment. I want to uh, ask you to pay careful attention to uh, connect regional bikeways. Don't balkanize them. Don't allow them to be separated. It's not enough to have parking and housing. We really need to have a connected uh, interjurisdictional inter -jurisdictional, um, bikeway. And then to the people in the room, I would say, uh, we as seniors, and I'm a homeowner, not in Orinda, obviously, we as seniors really need to make some accommodations so that our kids and grandkids can afford to live in the Bay Area. So thank you. Thank you, Adrian. <laughs> Next is Alvin Ziegler, then Robin Mitchell, then Scott Randall. My name is Alvin Ziegler, and I strongly oppose the forced real estate development of multi-unit buildings in Little Orinda. I <clears throat> uh, am a Orindan from 1964, I've lived in Manhattan, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Berkeley, and I've seen uh, the compromise of the quality of life of crowded, overdevelopment living, and I've returned at, recently uh, to Arinda as a homeowner to raise my two kids, and I am shocked that this is being spun as smart growth and green living, when I've seen what <laughs> that... Or if, Arenda is nothing, it's a paragon of what smart growth and green living really is, okay? And uh, a multi-unit housing means more impacted schools, more traffic, anything but smart growth and green living. Uh, parking meters, Wagner Ranch School where my little boy is going to be going has four kindergartens already. I attended OIS in Miramani, these are overcrowded schools already. I don't see the rationale in bringing the problems that exist outside of Orinda to Orinda. I cherish the way of life of Orinda. This is why I've moved there. And I think that, this, that I'm paying uh, real estate taxes to support that way of life. And I think that not being able to vote on that is taxation without representation, which is tyranny. Robin Mitchell, then Scott Renzel. Um, hello, I just wanted to offer a slightly different perspective on living near BART. Um, I live in El Cerrito, two blocks from the Plaza BART station, and I chose to live there. We looked long and hard to find a house that would be near BART so that we could um, have to, available to us the great transportation system that it is. And I have no problem sleeping next to BART, as someone said, how could anyone possibly sleep next to BART? Not an issue. And I know that all the people that are in the BART trains that go behind my house mean that there are that many less cars on the road and reduce greenhouse gases. And then, and thus, it will help support um, reducing climate change. So I support the, plan, the Bay Area plan, which I think will result in a good transportation plan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and our final speaker is Scott R-A-N-Z, I don't know, A-L maybe? Is Scott here? If not, I'd just like to thank you all for coming tonight. We take your comments very seriously. We will. We have taken note of them and the answers to your questions will be posted on our website. Thank you. And I would just like to echo that. Thank you very much for spending the evening 
um, and sharing your thoughts with, with us. Um, if you would like to offer additional comments, we have a website set up where you can uh, provide any comments you'd like to have. Our commission and staff will be reading those. And again, I want to thank you all for coming and uh, please don't hesitate to send in more thoughts or comments as uh, you learn more about the plan. Thank you again, everyone, for being here tonight.